We're going to start in a slightly odd place on this video. I'm concerned about Mr. Webb's comments about Diane Abbott and about the contribution of West Indian nurses. It casts a pall on migrant nurses generally, and it's offensive, to say the least. I'm going to start by revealing something. I thought long and hard about doing this, and then I thought I owe it as a tribute to the nurses who came from that generation from many migrant backgrounds or women who offered a great deal to Britain and gave the country sterling service, whether they were Irish, Caribbean, or came from further afield, or came from all sorts of backgrounds. Now, I'm going to share this. This is my mother's grave, where she, she died in 1990. It's not her original grave. This was where the headstone was changed. The original headstone wasn't very big because we didn't have a lot of money. This was a few years ago where, with my father's approval with, for this design, I sketched out this design and changed it to this. You'll, he w particularly wanted it done before he passed on himself as he's getting on. And this is a family plot as well. Now, that picture you will notice if I zoom in has my mother on the middle as a nurse. And that's because that's what she was. She was a nurse. Growing up to me, that's why I thought of her as most of her, as apart from my mother. It formed a major part of her life. Now, I'm going to stop sharing that, and I'm going to show how Simon Webb has once again managed to misrepresent and traduce people in a horrible, horrible way. Now, Diane is far from my favourite politician, I'll say that. But she does deserve the courtesy of having her words quoted accurately and how she's dealing with subjects treated accurately. She said some silly things. Most politicians do. But here's what Diane had to say. Streeting seems to think immigrants are overburdening the NHS. But without immigrants, including my mother's generation of nurses from the Caribbean, there would be no NHS. She didn't say the NHS wouldn't have started with, or that... It would never have got going, which Webb tried to maintain and push back onto a comment. She said she didn't talk of only Caribbean and Jamaican immigrants. She used immigrants in a very generalised way. Now, Webb offered up the following document as part of his evidence. Recruit, and it was this, history and policy documents. And this comes from... Um, history and policy papers, immigration, the National Health, Health Service, putting history to the forefront. And Webb read one line out of it. By the end of 1965, there were 3,000 to 5,000 Jamaican nurses working in British hospitals, many of them concentrated in London and the Midlands. That one line is what he read out. Notice the a bit above it. Now, I don't know how many of his subscribers actually clicked on his links and read them, but here's what it said. Recruitment of overseas nurses. Staffing crisis in British hospitals had been identified long before the establishment of the NHS in 1948. And concern over nurse shortages had been the subject of numerous government inquiries, which blamed low recruitment on inadequate training, poor pay and the marriage bar. During the Second World War, hospital domestic and nursing work was regarded as vital to the war effort and attracted a large number of women into national service. But staffing the new NHS was compromised by the national post-war labour shortage. The unprecedented increase in the medical and nursing workforce over the first decade of the NHS exacerbated the problem. Between 1949 and 1958, the medical workforce increased by 30% in England and 50% in Scotland. The nursing and midwifery workforce increased by 26% across Britain. The most severe shortages were in popular areas Unpopular areas such as nursing, such as hospitals for the chronically sick, mental hospitals, and in geriatric nursing. And yes, hospices for the dying were particularly awkward and difficult to work in. It's a field my own mother spent most of the time in. And anyone who is aware of St. Joseph's Hospice in Hackney, which they can look up very readily and is a very famous hospice, will then see where she worked. But that's a hospital that intersects with a lot of British and Irish culture, and I could do a whole presentation on it and may well do. As early as 1949, the Ministries of Health and Labour, in conjunction with the Colonial Office, the General Nursing Council, and the Royal College of Nursing launched campaigns to recruit staff directly from the Caribbean. 
Recruitment was aimed at three main categories of work, a hospital auxiliary staff, nurses or trainee nurses, and domestic workers. Senior NHS, half from Britain, travelled to the Caribbean to recruit, and vacancies were often published in local papers. They were also published in local papers, by the way, in Ireland at points. In 1949, the Barbados Beacon advertised for nursing auxiliaries to work in hospitals across Britain. Applicants were to be aged between 18 and 30, literate and willing to commit to a three-year contract. By 1955, there were official nursing recruitment programmes across 16 British colonies and former colonies. Over the next two decades, the British colonies and former colonies provided a constant supply of cheap labour to meet staffing shortages in NHS. Yet Webb has tried to use this document to convince you of exactly the opposite by pulling one line out of it. And the number of women from the African Caribbean entering Britain to work in the NHS grew steadily until the 1970s, early 1970s. And this is the one line Webb pulled out. By the end of 1965, there were 3,500. Three to 5,000 vacant nurses working in British hospitals, many of them controlled straight to London and the Midlands. But what he didn't pull out was the next couple of lines. It has been estimated by 1972, 10,566 students have been recruited from abroad, and that by 1977, overseas recruits represented 12% of the student nurse and win-wide population in Britain, of which 66% came from the Caribbean. And my question is, Mr. Webb, since you used this document and it's only three or four lines before, below, below what you pulled out, why didn't you pull it out? And that only talks of student nurses and, and midwives. It probably is a higher figure if we slap in fully qualified nurses. And there certainly were a shed load of Irish nurses, of course, in Britain, like my mother and many of her colleagues, such as a half-sister Mary, who is still alive and quite old, and would not be very amused by the notion of nurses of her generation being insulted, and has quite a hot temper. Mm. By the late 1980s, the NHS again faced serious problems in the retention and recruitment of re nursing staff, much as it had done in 1948. The problem now involved chronic shortages of both trainees and qualified nurses, yep, because it was began to be seen as a, a job that wasn't ideal and involved long hours, quite a low salary and a lot of stress and quite messy work, to be quite frank. Changing social expectations and financial constraints meant that young people were now seeking better paid job opportunities in other sectors of the economy. The abolition of work permits for overseas nurses in 1983 added to the difficulties. Meanwhile, an estimated 30,000 nurses were leaving the NHS every year. The departure blamed on long-standing problems associated with low salary alert and the pressures of the job. By 1998, well, of course, my mother was dead by eight year, for eight years by that point, but the point still stands that there are reports that the shortages in newly qualified nurses were approximating 8,000 a year. Problems intensified with the expansion of the NHS in 2000, which created additional demand for nurses that were met by recruiting workers from India. Now, since Webb only talked about nurses, we'll stick to nurses, but you notice it also goes on about recruitment of overseas doctors. Now, I'm going to also show you where my mother worked. This is a documentary that was made many years ago, well over 40 years, uh, 42 years, in fact, about called John Paul's People. It was about Catholics of Great Britain. And since St. Joseph's is very much a Catholic hospice, it features a section of it. The first section of it is actually quite interesting. It is about upper-class Catholics, but it's not particularly relevant to us here. But the family featured, despite being very upper-class British Catholics, are actually quite likeable uh, and quite funny. But in any case... I'd say that's probably a slightly stereotypical uh, view of Catholics, but moving on. I'll let it play after this point. That's St. Joseph's Hospice in Hackney in that era, and I remember it because I'd visit my mother and meet her as a kid.
and Sister Paula here would have been my what my mother's boss at points because she was among the senior nuns in the system. She's long dead now and buried near my mother, in, in fact. So it, you can, might begin to see why I'm beginning to get just a personally a bit annoyed about this one. Now, whether you agree with Sister Paula's point of view on faith or not, it takes a strong will to do that job day in, day out, with people who are seriously ill and dying. And there were numerous West Indian, Filipino nurses and nurses from all sorts of backgrounds in that hospice, which I can remember. And it is really, really horrid to see them being mocked and traduced in this way. I've got a few other little documentary bits from this era to show you. This is another hospice or care home for the aged. I found with it pictures from the 1970 and 79. Obviously, the nurses who look from, shall we say, un-English are obviously imaginary. That young lady with the black hair there arranging the flowers on the tray, She's obviously not real. She's obviously not a real nurse and doesn't exist according to the Simon Webb concept of reality. I'm damn sure the patients enjoyed having her about, though, because she was doing a, a job that's awkward and it is stressful. You're dealing with your own mortality when dealing with these patients. It's not funny and it's very, very stressful. And it's very hard on the men on the minds of those people who do it all the time. They have to develop a kind of emotional detachment or else they just couldn't do it because they are human beings. I couldn't do it. I couldn't remotely do the job my mother or her half-sister or my aunt did. Couldn't do this job. It would... Could, it would eat me up from the inside. And here we have, finally... These are black nurses in a classroom in the 1960s. The, the recording's a bit fuzzy and a bit bouncy, but it certainly answers the question of whether they were there or not. Diane did not at any point say only Jamaicans or Caribbeans, and Webb restricted his comments to dealing with them only. Now, I... As a final tribute, would like to say perpetual light shine upon all those nurses and doctors who worked in the system in that time, whatever their ethnic origin. And to see their memory diminished for the clickbaitry of cheap racist nonsense is vile. And I'm holding my temper in with great, great effort on this one. You have no idea how much great effort it is taking me to hold my temper in on this one, really. <laughs> 